thank the governor of Lake of River State because towards the tail end of his speech, he actually aroused not only my curiosity but also my enthusiasm because he raised the critical issues which I may not be able to articulate but which in my mind should be at the heart of the conversation we are having today. Nigeria, for very strange reasons, because I don't know any other country in the world that has reviewed its constitution over and over and over to the point that the exercise itself merely generates derision among Nigerians. And I say so because I've attended, I've attended one or two of these hearings, and from, the, from what seems to go on, Nigerians seem to be just yawning and wondering what is there to say again. It does seem to me that the persistence of our problems, our unresolved problems, is directly tied to the quality of our constitution, its ability or inability to inspire the confidence, the commitment of ordinary citizens. Now, I fell in love with the American Constitution, about which I know very little, if anything at all. But I, I, I've always gone back to three speeches. One, the Declaration of Independence in 1776, which formed the foundation what will become the American Constitution. Then, of course, there is the, the ratification of the Constitution itself in 1788, and then the famous Gettysburg speech of Abraham Lincoln. Barely 300 words. Now, subsequent amendments of the American Constitution from then to now come to only about 27, with 10 making up the Bill of Rights, largely making up for some of the things that the constitution framers did not anticipate. Now, I have found in debates about the Nigerian constitution a lot of issues that continue to reoccur. And I had the real honor and privilege of serving under Justice Nikki Tobi, one of the attempts at reviewing the constitution. What I have found, with no intention to disrespect anybody, was the problem of the quality of people that have been were sent and have been sent over time to review our constitution. Nigeria, a, an event so important, just like everything else in Nigeria, becomes an opportunity to distribute favors because governors and the president are those saddled with the responsibility of choosing those who are going to represent their communities. And of course, in debate after debate, it has always been very, very difficult to find anything other than a group of tribal unionists coming together to debate about their interests. The result is that, and I saw it very closely, Debates become, generate a lot of tension. And indeed, only last week I was in Enugu uh, to honor the late Justice Aniagolu and launch a book that had been written by him. It was an account of his experience with the 1989 Constitution. One of the things that struck me, and I think it's a book that is worth reading, because it more or less captures a lot of the issues that have consistently and persistently followed every attempt at drawing up an acceptable constitution that can attract the legitimacy of ordinary citizens. One of the things that he said, from 1977 debate right through till the last Central to every debate has been the issue of the place of Islamic law. 
famously known as the Sharia debate. And in conference after conference, if you read Justice Anyagolu's book, and if you also are familiar with some of the things that happened in 1977, the famous walkout, the Muslim delegates, and you would wonder, after all this while, why these issues have not been resolved. Muslims, Christians, unbelievers, the idea behind the constitution is not to create privilege, but it is to create a mirror around which every citizen can recognize themselves. But unfortunately for us, in 1989, even in the 1977 debate, 77-78, an American professor who published a book said that the idea of debating the Constitution, I mean Sharia law, became such a huge joke that when members got bored, somebody will shout from somewhere, please let's go to Sharia as a, as a means of distracting the members. The question then is, why has this continued to follow us? Because in 1989, Justice Aniagonu says, and I quote, he said on the day, or just a day or two before the meeting to debate the issue of the status of Sharia, he said, quote, and listen, all machets, daggers, and pangas in Abuja and Suleja markets had been bought out by both southern and northern delegates. Meaning, what kind of human beings did you send to debate in our constitution? And it's very interesting, Justice Anyagolu also lays out, and I want you to listen very carefully, the substance, because the debate suddenly became a debate between Christians and Muslims, between Southerners and Northerners. And the inability of the Nigerian political elite to rise beyond this ethno-regional confines must be located as one of the reasons why our country is progressing in reverse. Because when the Muslims were now asked to make their case, and the Christians were now asked to make their case, because you know, Nigeria is the only country where citizens don't die in this country. Okay, people die as Christians or Muslims. Now, when the house reconvened, the Christians tabulated their grievances. And listen very carefully. One, that they object to the fact that the Supreme Military Council had changed its name to Armed Forces Ruling Council on the ground that this was in response to the Muslims complaining that ordinary human beings cannot confer on themselves a title supreme. Then, of course, there was a second point of the potent OIC matter. Then the third point was the issue of Islamic Bank, whether Nigeria should take a loan or be associated with Islamic Bank. These are the positions taken by Christians, as articulated by Justice Anyagoli. And then, of course, that there was no mortuary in the hospital, National Hospital in Abuja. Christians were complaining that there are no mortuaries, and their ground was that there are no mortuaries because Muslims bury their people, immediately they die. So the decision not to have a mortuary, something that should go into Nigerian constitution. <laughs> it says that there, there were, the Christian delegation also alleged that there was a conspiracy against Christians because there were no coffin sellers in Abuja. And that the bus stops had Islamic signs. And that decree number 26 had been smuggled into the constitution and that it expanded the reach of Sharia law. And then of course that Muslims were being appointed to sensitive positions. And the Christians were also quarreling with the fact that there was no diplomatic relations with the state of Israel. And finally they raised the question as to why the president of Nigeria decided to send a delegation to Saudi Arabia to accompany Shegumi who had been given an award. The Muslims lined up their own arguments. One, that the legal system in Nigeria is based on Christian doctrine. And that Nigeria continues to use a Gregorian calendar, which is not acceptable to Muslims. And that, and this is just even more bizarre, 
that the military salute is in form of a cross, and Muslims should not be allowed to participate in this. And that hospital signs in Nigeria have a cross, and that diplomatic relations with Israel were a problem. Finally, why should Nigeria have diplomatic relations with the Holy See? Then the last, that Saturday and Sunday are declared work free days, and therefore they favor Christians. Now, I've made this very, I mean, I'm not producing, I'm just taking what is in Justice Alia. But to underscore the fact that we have probably never even come close the ingredients for the design of a constitution that can manage a diverse people with diverse expectations such as Nigeria is. And I make the point, therefore, that when the framers of the Declaration of Human Rights, I mean, the, 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 the U.S. Declaration, when they say we are committed to the proposition that all men are created equal, we are committed to the proposition that all men are, are, are created equal. Of course, as you will see later, the framers did not include black people, they didn't include women, they didn't include poor people, and barely 10% of the American population was literate. Notwithstanding that, and because the constitution can never be a perfect document, that is why amendments arising from the cries, the wails, the frustration, as a country looks forward to its possibilities, suddenly discovers that there are issues that the constitution may never have anticipated. Of course, in the case of the American Constitution, there are people like Justice Antonin Scalia who debated, who believed that no, the whole doctrine of originality, meaning that, well, the Constitution is more or less cast in stone and that everything can bounce off the Constitution. But his very good friend who died, I think, is it this year? Ruth Bader, one of my favorite justices. Now she says, she makes the point. Well, no, a constitution can is subject to amendment because the challenges that every society faces require that we should go back to the seat and make some correction. Now, most of this is neither here nor there, but you will imagine that if Nigeria is unable, if the Nigerian political elite and the Nigerian legal elite are unable to rise beyond the limitations that are not too different from the people that they left behind, then it is impossible for us to imagine that we can have a constitution. The result then is the penalty and the price we are paying, the volatility in the nation. And then the capacity and ability of politicians to exploit this sentiment. And I'll make the point towards the end. But this conversation is supposed to try and resolve a lot of issues. Issues relating to citizenship, national orientation, and then the whole question of leadership, followership. Nigerians remain conflictual in terms of what, who, who really is at fault. Is it the leader or is it the follower? But to pose that question is to have the mistaken notion that somehow leadership and office are basically the same. They are not the same. Because theoretically, it is possible to have office and not have power. It is possible to have power and not have office. Because one legitimates the other. Those who are Christians, remember, one of the things that was said about Jesus was that he spoke as somebody with authority. An authority is what legitimates a leader. There are people who don't hold office. So we must understand this con you know, conceptual reality that somehow we have kept going and coming. The leaders are blaming the people and the people are blaming the leaders. But clearly you cannot lead people until you have an idea about where you're going. And I think one of the crushing problems of Nigeria is our collective ignorance of one another. I keep saying it over and over, you know, and I'm exceptionally, I consider myself exceptionally blessed by God. Because people will say to me, so what are you doing here among lawyers? You know, go law school. You know, I was only a lawyer by aspiration. And of course, for me, it was in my almost final year in the seminary. Because I didn't plan to be anything else except to be a priest. And then we were told, no, you could want to be a priest and you may, you may be disqualified. I said, how? For failing exam? They said, no. They are keeping records of your behavior. So I said, well, let me start thinking of an option because it was almost like six months to our leaving the seminary. 
the only option I had was, if I didn't become a priest, I'll be a lawyer. And I'll try to be a damn good lawyer. But as I said, I want to plead with the bar. You know, I mean, if I have paid my dues, I've worked with three justices of the Supreme Court. It's not a small achievement. All right? And I've got all these friends who have been presidents of the bar. I should have something to show for it. Now, I, like I said to my, to my friend and my brother, uh, General Nagwe, when he became chief of army staff, I said, oh, God, I've spent over 25 years celebrating masses in army barracks. At least, let me have something like sergeant. I may not wear it, but if I enter army barracks, let me just show. So I expect the bar association to give me some concession. If I appear in court, at least let me show something that I'm associated with. But let me move forward very quickly. You know, I like one of the things I see here, which is taken from the movie, Catch Me If You Can, and the whole question of the illegal flow of funds. Now, whether it is Panama Papers or Pandora, we are saying that EFCC, there is a, a document going around. There are 100 cases that are still unresolved with EFCC. But in any case, what does all this say to the lives of ordinary Nigerians? I think this is where we must locate the crisis of the Nigerian state. Its inability, its lack of capacity to inspire the confidence of ordinary citizens. The reason, of course, is what we are having. Namely, that ordinary citizens have decided to make peace with alternative states. And the decomposition of the Nigerian state poses a serious question. Because when you tell me now that there is no country in Africa, 120,000 lawyers, extraordinarily intelligent, all of you sat past back. And you think this country can sink? Something must be wrong. And I think what is wrong is many of us are making the mistake of thinking that one day, you know, we are all very messianic. Nigeria, like, just hoping that a messiah will come and take away our sins. And of course, people say, well, when they were campaigning, I've had, luckily it's not from, from, from a Catholic priest. I've had from from, from um, shakes, and then you know, they, 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 the videos are there on the social media. Somehow, a constitution, every country, constitution is more or less a secular Bible, and it should command the respect of ordinary citizens. But like I say, and somehow Nigerians think that everywhere else in the world is wonderful except their country. But for this to happen, for us to reverse this, we must come to terms with certain realities. That is why I want to go to the point you know, that the governor made. Namely, the urgency of judicial activism. As I said, I like to read when I can some of the things going on in the United States. But all of you who are students of constitutional law and who are familiar with the situation, everybody knows the period in which El Warren was justice of the Supreme Court of America. Meaning that every judge, by virtue of that position, like Anthony Scalia said, there is no school to graduate from to become a judge. You have to just require your own personal instincts. And it depends on the moral character that you have before you are appointed. But he makes the point that because of the position that judges are, it is not a question of just being true to the law. It is that it is possible because every time a trial goes on, two people are on trial. There is the person who is being accused, but there is also the judicial system is on trial. Uh, 1963, June 11, or 1964, the trial of Mandela. It wasn't, Mandela was on trial, but the issues that were on trial were much more than that. And that is why after Mandela and his friends had been sentenced to death, Mandela was asked, it wasn't the play of mitigation. Mandela tells the microphone, I don't know whether it was the microphone, but Mandela stands up and delivers the memorable speech. Suggesting that he has no regret for being where he is, but there are certain principles that which he is prepared to die. And at the end, it was not the apartheid judiciary. The apartheid judiciary at that time was on trial. Indeed, 
In the famous Brown versus Board of Education judgment of the Supreme Court of the United States of America, 1954, what were the issues? What were the issues? Because human dignity, the sense of who we are, the argument was you could not have said in 1776 that you are committed to the proposition that all of us, all men and women are created equal. And yet, you have designed a process of education which Americans call you know, separate but equal. And all it meant was that if you are black, just the texture of your skin never exposed you to high quality education. But as God would have it, even from that background emerged the famous Togul Marshall. Togul Marshall felt more than any other person, more than the moral exhortation of Martin Luther King, raised the issue of the, of the law as the blame for sharpening society. Because if you look at the trial itself and the opportunities it opened, because without Brown versus Board of Education, there probably would have been no Obama. There probably would have been, would have been no Condoleezza Rice. There probably would have been no Colin Powell, God rest his soul. Here in Port Harcourt, the case of Professor Iyala Amadi, who deserves a round of applause. Because we had lived, you know, when certain terrible things in culture become, when they become embedded in culture, they become a religion. Now that it was every woman required, if you wanted to go to, if you wanted to get a passport, you require the permission of your husband. They required the courageous decision of Justice Olutu to say, no, it should not be so. So the point, therefore, is that lawyers have to constantly be knocking on the bar. Precisely because we have a choice. About three years ago, the Association of Nigerian Architects in Lagos invited me to come. I said, well, I don't know anything about architecture. They said, no, just come and talk to us. I said, I've never built a house. They said, no, just come and address us. While I was reflecting, the title, a title came to my head. And the title I gave it was, The Son of Man Has Nowhere to Lay His Head. <laughs> Building, you know architecture and the crisis of housing in Nigeria. And I enjoyed writing the paper. And when I made the presentation, they were happy. But the point I was making, and you said the same thing about law, you have a choice to make. You are either a lawyer for the rich and the powerful, or you are a lawyer with enough sensitivity, because every good lawyer has to have a third eye. And so I want to begin to end by asking, how did we get to where we are? Everywhere I go in Nigeria, one word keeps coming. I am tired. Everybody, most people you talk to in Nigeria, them, we are tired. And collectively, Nigerians are exhausted. Mentally, psychologically, physically, spiritually, we're mentally exhausted. And it's not time to trade blame, but it's time to ask ourselves, how did we end up with a country that is unable to perform according to its total capacity? Now, and here I want to make a point. And politicians must become very careful and more circumspect. If we are going to take a lesson away from Boko Haram, from banditry, from where we find ourselves now, it is that there is an urgent need for politicians to become more restrained in their involvement with religion. Because the religious identity remains a very, very troubling identity. Because it has the capacity to ignite passion. If you go, if you remember, over just 10 years ago, the governor of Bornu State then, who fraternized with Yusuf, the relationship, but as you could see, the fraternization was such that Yusuf believed I helped to deliver election. So I don't want only special advisor position. I need a bigger position. Okay, we become commissioner. Then you want something bigger. Then, of course, because he is associated with the governor, he becomes bolder and bolder and bolder. The rest is history. Secondly, you remember that in 1999, the whole debate about Sharia law, its space, and what exactly do Muslims want? Muslims believe they can only live out their religion within the principles of their religion. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. It shouldn't be a cause of problem. 
It is that a constitution must be sufficiently elastic enough that whether living your life and your culture necessarily needs to be shrined. Because for me as a Christian, and I believe I can say that of any religion, religion exists in the heart of man and woman. It's not, it's not, it's not the externalities. It's not the legalities. We're not every day thinking about the Ten Commandments. We need to get ourselves to a point in which religion doesn't just become a weapon, a stick for flogging one another. And if we are going to take any lesson away, it is that where we are now could have been avoided. Because in 1999, when the then governor of Zampara declared Sharia, other people declared, some proclaimed, it got fire right across northern Nigeria. Now nobody can put out the fire. Innocent people are dying by the day for sins they didn't commit. <clears throat> My governor is here only last week. 30, 40 people, just, you've gone to the market. No quarrel with anybody. People are busy trying to earn a living. So for me, the challenge for us now is to, how do we go forward? And we go forward, and I take, I make three points. One is the question of identity politics. Now, there is a man called Francis Fukuyama, and he published an essay in 1989, who finally became a book titled The End of History. He was the first scholar to attempt to make a prognostication of what will the world look like after the collapse of communism. And for us as lawyers and scholars and academics, we must always be thinking, not about the next election, because a good society must exist in our mind. The world we are in now existed in the mind of God before it came to be. So a good society must be subject of reflection. But increasingly, if you ask the average Nigerian, whether in high office or just, what book are you reading now? Many people will not be able to tell you. I remember when I invited the president of Ghana to the Guka Center, and he came. Somebody I've known for quite a long time. But the first question I asked him, I said, Mr. President, what book are you reading? And he told me the title of the book he was reading. At the end, he pulled the book out of his bag and gave it to me. He said, I can always buy another one. But I'm making the point that those of us in position of authority, you must constantly seek renewal of knowledge. Because otherwise, otherwise, what is going to happen is that you can hold this wonderful position and just end up with whispers, whisperers all over the place. Because it, it, that means leaders must begin to learn to shed weight. And I mean that metaphorically. That is the kind of people that surround you. Now, Fukuyama proposed something. It's all Greek, drawing from Aristotle, Plato, and so on. He said there is what you call Timos. And Timos is the internal thing that exists in your soul, which makes you say, I am somebody. And next to Timos is what he calls Isotimia. Isotimia simply says, do you know who I am? And all these forces are, are, are playing out in our real life because you want to be recognized as somebody. A woman you marry with no education suddenly becomes educated. She becomes a lawyer. Are you saying you are going to continue to treat her the same way? She's saying I am somebody. Now, the most dangerous identity is megalothemia. And megalothemia simply says, how dare you fail to recognize that I am superior to you? And an interplay of these identities is what politics is all about. The constitution, therefore, ought to be a document for negotiation, but also in, you know, incorporating many of these issues, precisely because if we don't, then we end up with the crisis of the powerful over the weak. Going forward, last week I listened to a radio, no, yes, last week I listened to a radio program on BBC by young Nigerians. It's called the Com, the Com, what you used to come here. That's the title of the program. You can probably look, look it up. I was, I was sad. When I finished listening to the program, barely 20 minutes, I was sad. Because young Nigerians, extraordinarily intelligent young people, are agonizing. And they are saying, we are not doing again. We don't want the country. Young men are telling you they are preparing to get married, but they are, they are putting punctuation mark. Because everywhere we turn, the entire country itself 
literally. We are like people being crushed by a boa constrictor. There's no space. We want to demonstrate, you can't demonstrate. Every young man carrying a computer is considered a Yahoo Yahoo boy. And yet the future lies in the computer. It's not every young man carrying a computer that, that is a criminal. But when you listen to the agonies of these young men and women, it is that we are forfeiting an entire generation. The traffic of Nigerians to Canada, into the United States and Europe. The average lawyer going to America will need probably two, three or four years before you settle down, pass their own bar, and then continue. And I'm sure those of you who have gone and come, because increasingly there are Nigerians who have gone and come. And some are going, some are coming. But it is in our interest, at least the Asians have done this very well, whether it's Singapore, uh, India, or whatever. The internal hostility between the young generation and our generation is unacceptable. Because we cannot go on like this. Therefore, I want to end by going back to Martin Luther King. You know the famous speech, I have a dream. I'm sorry, it's not my fault that I'm drinking this water like a bushman. This is, I, I, you know, many of you are familiar with the I Have a Dream speech of Martin Luther King. And many of you use part of it as a ringtone, where Martin Luther King talks about his four, his four little children. But one of the fascinating things about that speech is that Martin Luther King did not appeal to the Bible. He didn't appeal to the Bible. He appealed to the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Therefore, a constitution must have enough material, but also every citizen must be able to ask themselves, can I see a reflection of myself? We are all familiar, those of us who are lay people, even many of us are familiar with what is in chapter 2 of the constitution. But we are being told it's not justiciable. We cannot say that we are hungry. And because you are saying we cannot say we are hungry, we cannot go to court because we are hungry, when we will express our frustration Thanks for checking out Symphony on YouTube. Please be sure to subscribe and like our videos for updates.